Hello, this is Eric Topol on Medscape, and with me is my co-host, Abraham Verghese. And this is a really special edition of our podcast, Medicine Machine, because we have a phenom here, truly, Professor uh, Devi Sridhar, uh, who heads up uh, Global Health, uh, the Professor of Global Health at the University of Edinburgh, uh, who has been a guiding light uh, for the pandemic, not just uh, in Scotland or the UK, but for the world. And it's actually kind of amazing, uh, given her background and her age and everything else. So, Debbie, welcome. No, oh, thank you. And your introduction is too kind. We're all just trying to do our best, I guess, through this crisis. Well, I want to just reinforce my introduction is actually uh, very modest relative to um, the things that you've been able to accomplish in your young career. Um, there was a great October Lancet profile, which uh, in a way was the beginning of I got to ha- how I got to know you. Uh, and uh, Professor um, uh, Gostin at uh, Georgetown said, Devi is among the most inspirational and impactful global health leaders in the world. All of Devi's work is guided by the core values of achieving a healthier and safer world with equity and justice. That's pretty, that's pretty nice, Devi, really. Yeah, uh, it's kind of, you're gonna make me blush, a bit overwhelming. <laughs> Larry's always too kind in his, in his praise and in his words. Well, it's wonderful. It's well-deserved, really richly deserved. So let, let's start maybe with, um, well, uh, the, a little bit on background. Uh, the youngest Rhodes Scholar in history, you know, starting at age 18 as a Rhodes Scholar, having already finished college, uh, that, that, that seems kind of early. Well, that's just how my life worked out. I mean, I think everyone has different experiences that shape their life. And, you know, I never set out to be the youngest or to make life go faster. I just kind of had good mentors and was kind of always looking at what I wanted to do next. So, yeah, it's been it's been a journey, but now I'm finally getting a bit on the other side. Students now look at me and, and see me as old. So that's a bit of change. Oh, hardly. No, but what's amazing is um, here you were, you were growing up in Miami and you went to Oxford uh, for the Rhodes Scholar and you've never come back. We lost you. <laughs> I know this was the fears. So I came to Oxford and the plan was to go back actually to Harvard to do a joint JD MPH kind of program. So I was interested in public health policy and it seemed that was the way, but I had a really good mentor in Oxford. I wanted to spend time doing field work and actually on the ground in, you know, a low income context and middle income context to actually understand global health. And it seemed like that was the right time to do it. And that if I went into kind of a structured program, it wouldn't really fit my interests. And actually being an academic is absolute fit for my interests, which is combining research and teaching, um, advisory work, um, flexibility, able to do independent work, develop projects. So actually I've really, I'm, I'm kind of feel quite lucky that I was able to do my you know degrees in Oxford and pursue an academic position. Cause I think it's given me a lot of freedom to do what I always wanted to do from an academic base. Yeah, you were really prescient uh, in at the Hay Festival speaking out to say that we were not prepared for what was going to come. And sure enough, it came shortly after. And I wonder, um, you know, looking back, um, what you could, what we might have done better uh, along the way. I think that's a question we keep asking ourselves and also, you know, what it means for our future responses to pandemics like this. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone who was working in global health knew that a pandemic was not an if, it was a when, and it was most likely going to come from animals because we know that most of our really serious infections spill over from animals into humans and a respiratory pathogen would be the worst kind because it spreads so easily. And I think SARS-CoV-2 had an added challenge and then it kind of fell between stools. If it had the fatality rate of MERS, it killed a third of people, every government would have run towards elimination. There was no way any government could have said, we're gonna accept some incidents. Or if it was lower, much, much lower, let's say, you know, n- normal, like near seasonal flu, then we could have said, okay, we live with it. But unfortunately, it's too severe to live alongside, but it's not bad enough for governments to have a very clear vision of, unless you were kind of in East Asia or the Pacific, where they kind of treated this like a SARS-like event from the start. So I think one of the challenges has been in governments developing their strategies is actually how they saw it. And what you've seen very clearly is parts of the world that saw this as SARS have treated it like SARS and have been rewarded for having that strategy in terms of economic performance. And countries that saw this like flu have paid painfully, including through their economic performance, for under 
um, you know, estimating this virus. So I think the lessons for the future is you never underestimate and underreact to an infectious disease threat. You overreact. And then afterwards, you can, of course, ease when you get more information and understand how do we live with it. I mean, I think the other big lesson for me was about buying time. There was this idea when it emerged that there was no choice but for everyone to have to get it. The idea of this was unstoppable and you just need to build up your hospitals. We have to live with it and get on with life. But the last year, I mean, how many vaccine candidates do we have now that are successful? Every day there's a new one emerging, which showed that buying time bought lives. And actually the countries that now like New Zealand and Australia who can open up and vaccinate their entire populations have actually managed to escape this pandemic with very few deaths and actually keeping their domestic economy going. And the countries that have lost, like the United States, like Britain, Brazil, and others, you know, tens and thousands of lives, over hundreds of thousands of lives, and we look at it, actually have paid for not buying time over those months. Those people would have survived had they had access to a vaccine. We can see that now with the vaccine performance. So I think in the future, there'll be more of an emphasis on how do we buy time for science and more faith that actually science will deliver, whether it's a vaccine. So if there's an influenza pandemic, how do we move from sequencing to a vaccine quickly and get that out? We know we can do it for coronavirus. There's more ambition, but also you know, not underestimating the threat of how much destruction and devastation outbreaks can bring. Poor countries know that. West Africa knows this. They saw Ebola. You know, so South Korea knew this from MERS. Taiwan knew this from SARS. And unfortunately, we had to learn it the painful way in Europe and the United States had to learn it the painful way this time as well. Well, the point you're bringing up is really worth emphasizing. You know, this flatten the curve idea was mainly to try to spare medical resources from being overwhelmed. But what you have, I think, brought uh, to the fore here is that it saved lives. Uh, that is, people that were spared, not only with vaccines, but better treatments, better approaches, you know, everything from just learning what would be avoiding mechanical ventilation if we, if we could, or using anticoagulants or uh, dexamethasone, and then even monoclonal antibodies. So there, this whole idea that if you died earlier in the pandemic, you might have survived later. And uh, I think that's a lot of people aren't in touch with that. In fact, there's even a, a Wall Street Journal uh, op-ed today about lockdowns were a waste. <laughs> no, so they, they don't seem to get it still. Um, you've been advising uh, the government in Scotland and it had a really very remarkable um, course along the way. And then like many other places, perhaps it was the B117 UK variant, I don't really know. What, what happened there? So yeah, so you know, Scotland was aligned with the rest of the UK nations and going into a late lockdown in March. And at that point, it started to diverge slightly in terms of actually trying to get a local testing and tracing system up, so outbreak response in place, you know, holding lockdown measures for longer so that we could get the numbers low enough for test and trace to be able to function, because we know it only functions if you can identify outbreaks. And if it's everywhere, then the system breaks down. And as we went into last summer, we basically eliminated the virus. Sequencing has now shown this genetic sequencing that those strains were, were put out. And if I think of June and July, we had a pretty normal summer in the sense that most things were open. People in shielded groups were sitting in cafes. There was a sense of relaxation because the virus was, you know, every day they were testing thousands of people and finding two cases. And, you know, hospitals were empty. So there was a kind of relaxation. And then in August, um, tourism opened up. And tourism season. And this was both people going abroad on holidays, which is kind of a British institution that people go abroad to France and to Spain and Greece. It's like you know, your annual holidays. Um, and when they returned, there was no testing, there was no quarantine, and there was no procedures put in place. And so what happened is we got just got reimportation and, and the system got overloaded because you had too many fires, you had too many chains being set off. And at the same time, we had universities return, which in some instances were tens of thousands of students moving across the country. And, you know, again, not being tested, not being quarantined and going straight into, you know, um, communities. And this really triggered, triggered our second wave in the autumn. We managed to then put in place restrictions early enough to kind of keep it, the restrictions were in place low enough. But then B117 hit in December and we know how infectious this virus is. It is much harder to suppress. 
there was the idea in December that it would be unstoppable because if it was really 70% more transmissible, many of our measures would not work anymore in terms of keeping schools open, keeping enough you know, things running while having this variant. But luckily, and this was through a pretty severe lockdown in January, we managed to bring it down again. And now the idea is again, try to get to that level of elimination this summer where we were last summer, but this time we have a vaccine. The vaccine has been now rolled out to, I think, 40% of the pop of the adult population. The idea is all adults to be done by mid-July, I think similar to the United States ambition. At that point, to look at doing children in the autumn, if there are any approved vaccines at that point, and then to move to a point where now there are very, very strict travel restrictions. That lesson has been learned, so it's managed quarantine for anyone coming in, but then to start to open up in a more safe way so that we don't repeat this winter next winter. So I think, I mean, it was, I think a lot of countries suffered this, Greece as well, Iceland, where they managed to get on top of it. And then it was the travel and the tourism that kind of kicked off their second waves, which is a really hard thing because we want international mobility and countries to be open, but it's just very difficult in a pandemic. Well, another example of your impressions when you wrote the New York Times out there that we're going to pay for our summer vacation for the winter hit, and you were sure right about that. You could see it. I mean, I could see the whole situation falling apart. In some ways, it's common sense. If there's no virus and people are arriving from places where there is virus, then what is going to happen? We know how infectious this is. And the two things, you know, the anti-lockdowners often clamor. And the thing I say to them is the two things that will continue to get us with this virus is the number of susceptible people. So it can keep jumping. You get exponential growth and hospitalization rates, which means you can't just let it go because your hospitals, you know, get deluged, as we're seeing in Brazil. So until we solve one of those two problems, we're stuck. So vaccines solve the susceptibility issue. So we create barriers. There's a new study out today in Scotland that shows actually it stops transmission at the same time. Um, or we could have something that stops hospitalizations, which vaccines also seem to do, as well as therapeutics um, and so on. So I feel like this is how I try to describe it to the anti-lockdowners that, of course, we're all anti-lockdown. Nobody wants lockdown. It has massive harms. But which of the two problems are you going to solve for us? Are you going to go out there and develop a vaccine for us? Are you going to develop a therapeutic? Stop shouting at your anti-lockdown. Go do something useful to get us out of this bind. So that's kind of you know, my response to a lot of the people saying we're against restrictions. Who wants restrictions? No one wants restrictions. So. You know, like Eric, I'm, I'm just in awe of the breadth of your, of your work. And uh, so much of the work you've done preceding uh, this pandemic has actually turned out to be tremendously important. And so you've written a lot about governance and organizations like the WHO and uh, Gavi and so on. And uh, how how do you think they've done in this pandemic? How do you think the WHO and other you know entities like that, without the kind of supervision that one has, say, in academia or the regular the the oversight, how do you think they've they've done? Yeah, so WHO, I feel bad for the agency because you know. Former President Trump gave it such a difficult time. It was blamed for so much of the spread. And I feel like it was caught like a child in the middle of divorced parents between China and the United States trying to please both sides and ending up pleasing neither of them. Um, but I think to come back to it, you know, when people say, what can the WHO do? It can really only do three things. And I actually think it's done decently on each. Though, of course, we can grumble within that. So first, what can it do? Legally, it has the international health regulations. Countries notify it when an outbreak has occurred. China did that at the end of December. They alert the world this has occurred. They did that in early January. A memo went out to governments about this new cluster. They convene an international expert at the point to say, is this a public health emergency? First, they met on the 22nd of January. They said, no, we don't think so yet. Then, or they didn't say no, they said, we don't know. It was kind of like, you know, they were ambiguous. Then they reconvened on the 30th of January and said, yes, it was. And that's where the IHR end. That's, what, that's the alarm bell. They rung the alarm bell. And then it's ready for countries to prepare or not to prepare. So South Korea was already running. Taiwan was a month ahead. You know, countries started running at that point. And then you saw other countries just ignoring it, just saying, and, and people fixate on this word, oh, they didn't say it was a pandemic. And I say a pandemic means nothing legally. The word that matters was the public health of emergency of international concern, which was January 30th. So I think they did a good job on that. I mean, how much faster could you move by January 30th? Because, you know, you have to be careful not to overreact. You know, there's 300 outbreak events every month. How many are you going to declare an emergency? You have to use it very sparingly. The second thing they can do is bring governments together. And they did that at the World Health Assembly last May, where there was a res resolution passed, including with the United States, even with the Trump president, which said... Um, 
that they would approve, um, you know, to share any benefits, you know, of research of vaccines. You saw the COVAX facility to share vaccines and government said, yes, we're going to do this. We're going to share vaccines. We're going to share stuff. So they got the agreement. Unfortunately, no one honors agreements of that kind as we've seen. They did that. And then the third thing they can do is technically do briefings. And so from early January, they did do daily briefings. And if I think the governments who listened to those daily briefings, because I listened to them from early January, you knew a lot going into February, especially that China mission that came back in February. By that point, we knew who is who's most at risk. You basically knew your risk groups. You knew the age gradient. You knew how it spread pretty well. And you knew actually that you could use contact tracing and testing to bring it down alongside lockdown measures. Wuhan was only in lockdown, I think, for 70 or 75 days, which is remarkable given we're going to be in lockdowns for over a year and a half in other parts of the world on off lockdowns. And the countries that listened, New Zealand, Australia, East Asia countries, even in Europe, Finland, Norway, Denmark, did better. The countries that didn't even know what had happened, they didn't listen to WHO, that it was an agency for poor countries, ended up trying to reinvent the wheel and kind of find their own way through it. So they came out with studies in you know, March or April saying, oh, these are the risk factors. I'm like, well, we knew that. We knew that from February. You know, Britain waited until Italy fell. You know, Lombardy fell in terms of their health system collapsing before they said, oh, this is a problem. I was like, well, China built a hospital in a week in January. We knew it was a problem at that point. So in a way, I mean, I'm, I'm sympathetic to WHO. Were they slow? I think they were slow on, for example, human to human transmission in January. It was clear it was human to human transmission much earlier than they acknowledged. The second was on the airborne elements and the aerosol elements. I know this has been, they've been heavily criticized, but I think at some point they should have just moved quicker on that. The asymptomatic spread, I think that's been really controversial. Is it pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic? It's better, again, to overreact, assume asymptomatic spread at this point and react in that way. So we get people masked, wearing masks and actually acting responsibly. So have they been slow on certain things? Yes, but the truth is all of us have been slow. So I think all the experts also criticizing them need to take a look in the mirror and say, where were we last January? What were we saying? Because I think we may not like to hear what we were saying at that point either. Well, that, just to anchor that question that Abraham asked you, Debbie, um, there's been two books you've written. Uh, the first one, The Battle Against Hunger, uh, that was in 08. And then you wrote a book with Chelsea Clinton, uh, Governing Global Health, Who Runs the World and Why. Now, so how did you and Chelsea get together? So Chelsea did her PhD in Oxford on the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. She was very interested in the global response to AIDS and the structures. And I think her father was very involved in setting up many of those structures. And so she did a PhD looking at how it was set up and how it's um, how effectiveness has been. And I was a postdoc at the time in Oxford and we got to know each other. And when she finished that, we thought we should bring together our work because I had done a lot of work on WHO and the World Bank, kind of the key multilaterals in health. And she had done a lot of work on now the Global Fund, but also Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. So we said we should combine that and actually do a book that overviews how does the global system operate and function. And so in that book, we actually start looking at infectious diseases and we end with looking at infectious diseases. We end on polio and start with Ebola. Um, But it was clear we did an op-ed last February, um, so a year and a bit ago, where we could see looking at the U.S. infrastructure that under a Trump presidency, it was not ready for a pandemic. You could already see the writing on the wall by February that the U.S. was going to struggle really badly. And absence of that federal response, I think, is what you know we paid for painfully. And I think the issue this comes back to is we can evaluate as much as we want countries' response. We can create indices. We can talk about core capacities. We can talk about surveillance. But in the end, a lot of how countries did had to do with their leadership and the political decisions made, bold decisions by leaders who managed to carry their people. This was really about leadership and getting populations to understand the scale of the challenge and what was required of them together to get through this as a community. And we can see that leadership is just essential on the countries that have suffered. I mean, I know in the US, they are trying to turn it around now with you know, the ambitious vaccine programs have been states with you know, Trump, Bolsonaro in Brazil. You know, Brazil shouldn't be struggling the way it is. It has a pretty good health system. It's a better, more advanced country than many of its Latin American neighbors, um, as well as in the UK with Britain, with Boris Johnson, if I think a year back, who was very consumed with Brexit and was still telling people he was going into hospitals and shaking hands with COVID patients and that we shouldn't be scared of this virus. So I think there is something to say about leadership styles as well compared to more cautious styles, which tended to come actually bizarrely from female leaders. If we think New Zealand, Germany, even in Europe, Iceland, Finland, um, Norway, and Scotland, also we have Nicola Sturgeon here. 
So I think um, in the future, the interesting thing will be is we can make as many metrics as we want. We can evaluate countries' lab capacities and testing infrastructure and hospitals. But in the end, it's about the person who's in charge and how they actually lead a country through a crisis. Which uh, leads me to a follow-up question, and it's one that I always bring up on this, pod this podcast, which is, uh, you know, we, we know that there's a virus and that's a tremendous problem. We know there's poverty and there's a tremendous problem. But I think a, a big problem in this epidemic has been ignorance or sort of willful, ignorant, ignoring of science, both by leadership, especially by leadership, but also by the general public. And I think there's really a need to treat this uh, as a public health disorder, just the way we treat you know, poverty or uh, malnutrition, because it really is at the heart of this pandemic. And as a global health expert, what does one do about the kind of willful ignorance that got us into such trouble in the United States and all the other countries that you mentioned that have not done well? Yeah, so I think, you know, for me, there's been, you could say three sources of this, well, at least three. And I think one was leaders who deliberately misled. If we look at, you know, again, a great example is Donald Trump, who took a vaccine while telling people that he didn't even admitting to the public he had had a vaccine for him and his, his wife, who, you know, denied this was serious for many months, treated it as like the flu, you know. Um, so there's first kind of bad leaders, Bolsonaro now telling his people to stop whining while, you know, there's mass graves being built. So there's that kind of you know, why do we elect those kind of leaders? I think there's a lot of questions there. The second thing I think is actually these bots or accounts, or even they're not even bots, they're people who spread misinformation. It could be bots or people online. I mean, you know, Eric knows this being on Twitter, but the amount of disinformation being spread and the videos being created by people who just call themselves professor, they're not even professors, they just call themselves professor on their Twitter handle and they give themselves a PhD credential and then they're putting up YouTube videos that are being seen in India and people aren't taking vaccines because they said, I saw some professor. I'm like, at what university? We don't know, he calls himself professor. I'm like, it's, um, it's amazing to watch. So I think that I've really struggled with because it's, you can't fight every single one of them because they're too many. So you end up being consumed in the mud. So how do you stay out of the mud of this kind of, you know, anything you say, someone says something, the opposite of it. And then I think the third thing that's been really difficult, and it's not even disinformation or misinformation, it's academics who are real academics, but who stuck their heels in very early to their position and refused to move. So last January, February, some academics came out and said, Either things like most of the population have already had it or there's pre-existing immunity or it's not as bad as we think it is. And they have not moved. The world has moved. We have evidence. And I really admire people who will say, OK, we thought the IFR, the infection fatality rate, was much less. It's higher than we thought. We reevaluated our, re our position. Or people who said, I didn't agree on masks, but now I agree on masks because I can see that they're important. Or... I mean, to go through all the things have we have we you know discussed where I feel instead people have kind of dug in their heels yeah. and stayed where they are. And schools is a classic example. I, I get hit on both sides from about schools. The people who say I'm killing children and teachers, and the people who say I'm damaging young children by keeping schools shut, which means I'm in the right space. But the amount of academics who are sharing things saying kids are super spreaders and silent vectors and going out. The evidence doesn't show that over the past year. Maybe the new variants change it. I'm open-minded, right? I will change my mind as the evidence changes. And then you have on the other side, the people saying, no matter what, we need to let schools run, regardless of what's happening. I'm like, well, that doesn't work either. We know the schools will just become full of infections from the community, but nobody seems to want to ever move in academia. I think it's the egos and the need to be right. And I think in the States is a great example. I don't want to mention my name, but you know, from Stanford, some of the classic institutions, Stanford, Harvard, Oxford, professors coming out with things that actually are not evidence-based. And it's astonishing that they're not willing to say at some point, I got that wrong, I'm willing to move. Instead, they just keep kind of digging themselves in a deeper and deeper pit. That's been astonishing. So I think there's like three sources I see, which is like the academics who just refuse to move because of their egos, the bots and the celebrity account, fake pseudo celebrity accounts pretend to be professors. And then of course the leaders who just um, are populist and not in tune with actually science. Yeah, I had an interesting experience of debating uh, uh, Martin of, uh, of Harvard on the Great Barrington uh, Declaration. And I said, wow, but your point about the, the mis and disinformation spreading uh, much more widely than the real facts and truth is, is uh, so essential. Medicine and the Machine will be right back. Welcome to Medscape's latest podcast series, Medicine and the Machine. 
featuring Medscape's Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eric Topol, and Master Storyteller and Clinician, Dr. Abraham Verghese. Remember, you can find the latest in medical news, expert perspectives, clinical tools, continuing medical education, and more at Medscape.com. You know, one of the things that I um, find so rich uh, that you do, Evie, is you get into the heads of the people through Twitter uh, to try to be uplifting. And every day you have messages, you know, about get outside and, you know, um, the, see the bright side. I, I, maybe that's the best way to summarize it. I think that's really invaluable. Uh, do you get um, any pushback about that? Or, you know, what, what's been the kind of response? Because I think you do it in a way that's really extraordinary. Oh, thank you for that. Well, that's kind of like my personality, which is a kind of a glass half full person. And I knew going into this winter, we were going to go through a really rough time. I wrote a piece actually, I think back in October, which is the next four months might be the hardest of your life. Because I could see, you could already see November, December, January, February, we're going to be horrible. We just knew it. And I think almost telling people up front, it's going to be really bad. We're going to get through it together and we're going to make it to the other side of this. And the spring will get better. And it is better. We can see the summer is going to be much, much better once we vaccinated. I'm very optimistic in that sense right now. It was kind of giving people the idea that we have to look to tomorrow and not to kind of collapse under the burden of today. Have I gotten flack? Of course. Yes. Yeah. So I had, you know, there's, there was this, I call them like the mean girls of Twitter. There was a few who was like, oh, you know, she's like a, you know, I bet you, what did they call me? She's like, she talks, I don't know if I'm on safe and paths, but they're like, she's full of unicorn crap you know, leave her to her unicorns and her rainbows. And I'm like, well, if that's the worst you can say about me, then I'll take it. You know, I bet you unicorn crap probably tastes like bubble gum. I mean, what's the worst? You know, it's like, so you get this on Twitter, which can be silly. And I think, you know, we have to give people realistic information, but also hope. And there are tough messages today. For example, I did say happy Friday, but I also said children have gone backwards across the world. And we're in quite a difficult position with children and a whole lost generation in terms of how much pain these young people have gone through, whether it's girls being forced into early marriages in poor countries because schools have been shut, the amount of abuse that's taken place across the world because children have been locked in their homes without access to supportive structures, kids who have missed out on meals, rising poverty, including in rich countries, which means increasing use of food banks, children going hungry. These are real issues, but I think we have to do it in a way that gives people hope that we can make it better. So what does that mean? It means we need to put children at the heart of recovery. What does that mean? As we release restrictions, we let schools go back first before anything else. It means we let, in Scotland, for example, children can play outside and do sports before adults. My next goal is that children can go into each other's houses and have play dates and interact before adults can mix. It's about saying, if we know children are bearing the brunt of this, how do we develop our policy responses and our scientific advice in a way that puts a children's first lens on it and says for ethical reasons, for moral reasons, we need to put children first for, for the future and think ahead because Really, you know, we, we I, I think our responses were, were appropriate for what we did, but children have suffered. And I think anyone who says that isn't paying attention. And so it's about the realism co coupled with, well, what do we do about it? Because there's no point talking about problems if you don't have solutions alongside them. Yeah, and just to follow up on that point, uh, we have such a varied response about schools here in the state, uh, in the States, because it's all state based or sometimes even district based. Um, do you have any guidelines or any thoughts on, you know, what, what are the parameters that allow us to return kids to school safely, uh, how we go about that? Yeah, so the way we, so I've worked on schools now for the last year and a bit and are like different and I'm a, and I'm very, very closely involved with the, the Scottish response to getting schools back. So I'd say we looked at this in four ways and I think this is how we have to look at it. The first is what is the risk to children if, if they get the virus in a school environment? The second is what is the risk to their families if they bring it home? to parents, to grandparents. The third is what is the risk to teachers in terms of occupational risk of being in a classroom with children? And the final one is what are the implications for R or community transmission, which is what we wanna keep under one so we don't have an accelerating epidemic. And so I think through each of these, we kind of try to collect the evidence at each point and answer them. We know even with the new variant that the risk to children is minimal. I mean, it can happen, but if we keep our numbers low enough, it's when your numbers explode that you have problems in children. When your numbers are low, you're okay. We know older children can be um, transmit more than younger children, but generally younger children are better. Then we said, okay, what is the risk to parents in their communities? So yes, children can transmit. We know they can transmit less um, than, than, than adults so far. We've seen more adult child transmission than child to adult. 
Then we said, could children be largely asymptomatic carriers, silent spreaders? So then we looked in hospitals where for surgeries, all children are being tested. And we actually found very few asymptomatics. And now we're finding something similar because we've introduced lateral flow testing twice a week into schools. And again, finding very few asymptomatic children, as many as you'd expect. It's not like it's like half of kids are asymptomatic. Um, so we said, okay, well, if we keep the numbers low enough then we won't have introductions. And the third is risk to teachers. And again, I think what we found is that it does seem occupationally from our surveys that from antibody tests and others so far, teachers have not been more severely affected. Of course, our numbers have been low though. It's in the context of low prevalence. And I think that's what it comes back to when we come back to the final one on community transmission, that if your numbers are low, you can run schools. I mean, in Scotland, 76% of schools had no cases like no cases at all. And they ran full time in person, all kids in the classroom. Distancing was not possible in the classroom because otherwise we couldn't fit enough kids in. We looked at that option and you end up increasing inequalities because private schools can do it. You know, public schools can't. We looked at masks. We said masks make sense for older children. They don't make sense for younger children who need to develop their speech and cognitive ability, you know, to be able to interact and see facial expressions. So we said masks, depending on prevalence, we kept in bubbles. So we had outbreak response. So when there was a case, you could stamp on it quickly and get the bubble into isolation. So there were things put in place, but in the end, the lesson for me is keep your prevalence low and keep schools open. And if you keep them low enough, so we've had schools now open here three weeks in Scotland. And um, yes, there have been clusters in schools, but we have to keep our prevalence low and keep R under one and expand the vaccination program and try to get through this and try to keep schools open. So it's bumpy. I guess I think there's no easy answer. Do I think schools should always be open? No. Do I think they should always be closed? No. I think it's actually how we work with the evidence and our current levels. And every week we get evidence in not through tracing, through now these lateral flow devices. T teachers are being tested twice a week with these, but taking the issue seriously. And the B117 one worries me though, because I think when there's a variant, you need to think if it's more transmissible, is it more transmissible in children? And could what we know change? And that's why we've been going very, very slowly in terms of, um, you know, monitoring and opening up now, almost the frustration of the public. They say, oh, our numbers look the same as they did in September when everything was open. And I said, yes, but we have a new variant. And we know that actually we need to act like we, there's a lot of uncertainty. But so far it seems to be going smoothly. But yeah, schools are a difficult one. We know kids need to get back. And this is why the, the point I keep trying to make to people is it's not about our schools not safe or safe. It's how do we make them safe enough to make it acceptable to open? And also we need to listen to all the stakeholders. What are teachers saying? You know, what are scientists saying? What are, you know, we have a teacher rep on our group that we listen to and on the, what does it mean on the front line for how she's operationalizing things. But I think what I don't like, it's become a very big shouting match between big egos over who wants to be right or wrong about schools. And actually kids are missing out and losing out because it should be about what's, what's best for kids. Now, one thing I'm curious about, uh, Debbie, is you've been at the University of Edinburgh, you have a um, you've been there six years as a professor, chair in global health, and as an American, you're now admixed with all these Brits and uh, Scottish folks. And are you? Uh, is there any uh, xenophobia, or is there any? Do you feel any uh, less uh, um, accepted as a person coming from outside the the UK? You know, it's quite been the opposite, actually, especially in Scotland. I've been so overwhelmed by how warmly I've been received here. And Scot Scottish people in general really like Americans. Yeah. They like, they especially like Florida, where I'm from. I think they like going there on holiday. And so actually just overwhelmed by how welcoming. I mean, I couldn't believe it in terms of you know, at the end of the year, people were, you know, even things like, you know, be, being up for Scots Woman of the Year. And I'm like, I, me of all people, like a Floridian, a Miami girl who's ended up here. And just the warmth that I felt for this. I mean, it is tricky politically right now because Scotland is has has a government, an SNP government, and it's called the Scottish um, National Party led by Nicola Sturgeon, who wants Scottish independence. And so there is, of course, very strange political undertones. Americans won't fully get it. I didn't fully understand it. Um, when I arrived here about when you say things good about Scotland, people automatically assume you're pro-independence. And the point I've made is like, when I lived in Miami, I was proud of Miami and I spoke well of Miami. When I lived in DC, I was pro DC. When I lived in Germany and South Korea, I love the places I live in and I want to represent them well. And so I think that's been the only kind of catch. Sometimes I get myself into trouble because people think like I've been called both the globalist because of my ties to the, you know, the world economic forum and my global health work and WHO and Gates and, 
you know, this whole kind of globalist conspiracy of the deep state. So I've gotten a lot of those conspiracy theories set my way. And then I've also gotten all the national stuff of, oh, she's like a xenophobic nationalist, like me being called xenophobic um, here, which I find, I mean, it's funny to my friends in the States, but it's not funny when you're actually living it. And people say like, oh, you're xenophobic because you say after, like last summer, I was saying we need to not let people go on holidays. And people said that's xenophobic. And I'm like, well, how is it xenophobic? Mali's closed all its borders. India closed its borders. Vietnam has done it. New Zealand, are they all xenophobic countries? You know, like it's the public health policy we're putting in place for a pandemic. And actually people then said, oh, well, it's for forever. You're trying to shut us off for forever. And I said, well, no, until we get vaccines. And now that vaccines stop transmission, we're going to head to the world of vaccine passports and we're going to have international mobility. And I'm sure once they, we have confirmation from many sources, they stop transmission. Australia, New Zealand will open up. They're going to vaccinate their population and they're going to open up and they're going to be back to international tourism and mobility. It was a period of time during a pandemic where we had to survive those months to buy time without taking the hit of domestic restrictions or, and, you know, having the lives lost. So that's the only hiccup I've gotten into, I think, was is both kind of the idea of like you're you're either a globalist or a nationalist, which comes from weird sources on the Web. So who even knows that they're real people. Um, but in overall, it's been really, really, to my astonishment, like really welcoming and really positive experience being here. Yeah, I had a similar experience, although it was more transient. When I did the NHS review with, you know, invited by first Jeremy Hunt and then Matt Hancock and working with about 50 people from throughout the UK on that review. I, I you know, the respect for Americans, despite uh, some of the problems that we have, uh, was really pronounced. Well, you know, one of the other things, I guess, uh, is if, can we ever get you back in the U.S.? I mean, you're you're a force. You are a force of nature. We need your help here. Is there any chance we can we can figure out a way, a path for you to be to come 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 home? Well, I mean, the great thing I think about COVID, if we think of silver linings, is we work so much internationally now through Zoom. So like the past three days, I've been co-chairing a meeting for the National Academies of, of Science, Engineering and Medicine on um, the next flu pandemic. You know, and, and, and that freaked me out because they're like, well, what if we get something as contagious as measles and as deadly as Ebola? And I'm like, let's just stick with COVID. <laughs> Like, let's not go into that universe. Um, and so that's exciting to be working like in D.C., like basically virtually in D.C. on something that advises the U.S. government. Um, but I'll see where life takes me. I think the great thing about the States is you have so many excellent scientists um, like you both and others, you know, they've been hampered because we had an administration that didn't listen to the scientists. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the CDC is a force as well of, of, of good and, and of science and such a, you know, track record. So I think what was really painful to see was to have all of that resource completely, you know, what's the word, like just completely silenced, muzzled. And now hopefully with Biden, I think we are lo looking towards really positive times. You know, you have Tony Fauci in a very prominent role. You have so many brilliant academics who are there. And so I kind of feel like the States is in good hands. I mean, I don't need to worry anymore about with the States because there are enough good people now. There are enough good people in the White House in the important positions that you kind of feel like, actually, I don't need to pay attention anymore to what's happening. I'll just let them get on with it and get back to both thinking about low income countries but also making sure in my roles in like Britain that I kind of keep things, hopefully an eye on things here alongside my colleagues. Well, what choice do we have? I mean, we have to wake up every morning and think it's going to be a good day and get on with life, right? And try to find our way of being happy and productive and find joy. Not necessarily. <laughs> well, you know, it's like, I think humor helps a lot. I think if anyone follows me on Twitter, you know, I try to respond to any abuse I get with humor because I find it quite funny sometimes, the kind of accusations I get. Um, I have to restrain myself from not, you know, being too sarcastic to some of the stuff and trying to just ignore it. So I think humor, laughter, positivity. Um, I exercise a lot. So I think that's probably my addiction. So I exercise in the morning and at night usually to kind of just try to get to process things. Um, and I think the, the real thing, I think I said, people staying in the moment 
So right now it's so easy for your brain to become overwhelmed because there's so much happening, whether it's in your personal life and your friends' lives and with the news cycle. And, you know, even now I feel like my brain has been deluged with the whole Meghan Markle thing. I don't know if it's made it over there, but like that's been huge yeah. here. Yeah. And so it's just kind of constant. And so when I do something, I try to block everything and just be in the moment. So if I'm writing a Guardian piece, I'm like, it doesn't matter what's happening in the world. I got to focus on this. And if I'm with a friend and they're saying to me, they're going through a really hard time, I try to focus on them and listen to what they're saying in that moment. Because having that burden of to do things and laundry lists and kind of the weight of the world in your mind is exhausting and it makes you paralyzed. And so I think it's just in some way, I call it goldfish kind of memory, which is like when I'm with someone, I'm like, I'm just going to focus on you and I'm not going to focus on anything else. And then when I get to my work, I'm just going to focus on that. And I'm not going to think about other stuff. And when I go to bed in the night, I just clear my head. I'm like, I can't think about anything. So you won't sleep. I do say, I mean, the, the schools has kept me up at night because it's, it's, there's so many conflicting data points mm. and there's so many stakeholders and they're all not wrong. So, you know, sitting in meetings where unions are telling you how teachers are sobbing, they don't want to go into classrooms because they're scared they're going to be infected. And they're, and you are wondering, is a teacher going to get infected and die because we gave the wrong advice at the same time hearing we get every week, you know, a report from, you know, the child welfare officer and you hear about the rises in child abuse and the children who are actually getting beaten up at home because they're not able to get out and they have parents who have lost their jobs because they're angry and they're stuck in tiny flats and they have no money. And you're thinking, well, kids need to get back to school and no one is wrong, right? Everyone is right in what they're saying to you, but it's how do you give the best scientific advice? And I think what keeps me up, if I say the one thing that does stress me is am I giving the best scientific advice where are the holes in my argument? And actually, I welcome rigorous debate and hard questions and people telling me when I'm wrong, as long as it's not name calling. I think that's just, that's a lot of Twitter. But I mean, if someone says to me, sends me an email and is like, I think you're getting that wrong. I really listen because I want to know if I'm getting it wrong because I really want to get it right. Well, this has been an extraordinary conversation with you, Debbie. And I think um, it's in a way without knowing it, you were kind of trained for the pandemic throughout your life. I mean, you all the time you spent, uh, whether it was in India or uh, in the, um, uh, with focusing on malnutrition and poverty, and then with Ebola. And uh, I mean, it's extraordinary. And uh, of course, we're going to get through this pandemic. And it's going to be really interesting to watch your next chapter, where you go. And I have to say, ever since I got to know you from your writings and your work, I, I can't, whenever I see the term or think of global health, I, can't, I think of you, because you are just an extraordinary leader. And you and you have such a, an incredible career in front of you. I mean, we're going to be following you because uh, we know great things still lie ahead. So thanks so much for sharing your views. I mean, these are complicated matters, perhaps epitomized by the schools, but so many other things that we've discussed. And it's been a real joy to have you uh, join us today. Indeed. Thank you so much. No, thank you. And thanks for all that you're doing. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're, you're amazing. You really are. I'm just overwhelmed by how gracious you're being to me, because most of the time I'm hearing how rubbish I am. If you're on Twitter, it's like 99% of people telling you why you're wrong. Or today I posted like my lunch, which was chocolate and a like bread. And I'm like, I'm not going to look at the response to that. I sent a cake tweet and I got so much hate for that. I don't know if you saw that. Um, but yeah, I think right now after this is finished, I want to go to Bali. <laughs> I've always wanted to go to Bali. I'm like, I'm going to do it when the, when I get my vaccine passport and things are sorted and then see where this goes next and hopefully go back to kind of the quiet academic life that kind of has been missing for the past year and back to things I love, which is teaching and research and actually looking at interesting questions. But thank you for having me. And hopefully at some point we'll get together and be able to meet whenever we get into meeting in person somewhere. I love California. I'm envious of your sunshine and your and your good vibes and the nice weather. Well, I can say you have a standing invitation at Scripps and Stanford for sure. And we'll look forward to meeting up with you in person at the other end of this thing. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Cheers.